for that lovely introduction and thanks very much for inviting me to be part of the great birthday party. Happy birthday, the other room. I'm going to start by reading some poems in a fake German accent because I've written 26 of these and it's a borrowing from my grand. The first one was published as um, one of the POW broadsides. And so you can see I've sort of phonetically written this poem in my granny's voice. And yeah. Not so many days since we arriving. This grey is like Berlin. This same grey day we have. This northern vessel on the damp street. A bit of rain won't hurt. Will help the trees on this hamster his fissy infect. <laughs> Why should I mind that? I drive with the buses. Her conductor asking me, for what? I don't exactly remember. Fast, please. To him, my penny I hand over. He nods with a kind smile. Funks love. <laughs> he says, Oh, I am his love. Turns handle on machine, now curls the ticket. This is when I know that here to settle is okay. This city will be home, where even on the bus is love. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'll read a couple more of those and then I'll tell you a little bit about the latest project I've been working on, which has been immensely exciting and fun as well. Um, I didn't really know which ones to read you, but it was quite good to follow the pigeons with London, wasn't it? So now we'll think, what else have we not had tonight? Um, Merich. Merich. My, grand my grandparents had quite a dodgy marriage. You'll feel here. Marriage. He is twice the size of a normal person. I am half the size of a normal person. This is our ridiculous arrangement. I'm the mouse that cooks and cleans. He is the roaring elephant who must research the intricacy of the body and the correct medicine to administer. <laughs> he plays on the gramophone that awful pounding Bruckner. I serve up my famous pork loin, backed in the oven with onion. He plays chess with our son. I dance fetters with our daughter. We value the intellect above the tittle tackle. He likes to work and go to bed with other women. I like the parks to walk and do the garden. The children read, do sums, pass their exams. Who are we? We are just normal people. Two of the pork-eating Jews of old England. <laughs> <coughs> I actually love reading these, so I, I would be quite happy not to talk about the next project and just go on and on in this fake accent. I don't know what my granny, well, I do know what my granny says. She quite approves of them, because she's kind. <laughs> Um, I could read you uh, one that she's written from the afterlife. <laughs> there are three sections, you see, London, Germany, and the afterlife. The afterlife goes from 1980, that's when she died, and this is the, me listening to her now. Wash by hand, learn by heart. The youngest of my great-great-grandchildren is lining up her dolls and bears for class. When they slump in ragged exhaustion, she arranges them to lean on the cupboard. Sit up straight, she commands. If any one of you knows the answer, don't shout out, put up your head. The sweater that this teacher wears looks oddly familiar. The Van Ant sent from Vienna for my girl when she was small. I see the wool, still has some bounds. 
Want amazingly, no more holes. Funny, Frida always said she didn't like to knit. And heavens of patience, she lied. This sweater has an intricate pattern of blue squares raised in a ridge over a nice white stocking stitch. I marveled at it then when it arrived, springing like a lamb from stiff brown paper. Within weeks of that, Frieda, like so many, was seized, imprisoned, murdered. Now this enduring labor of hers is worn as a kind of uniform, commanding all who are born or even stuffed. Make things, make things up, play. <laughs> Now, the real fun I've had lately is I've, I've been paid to go and sit in a house in a forest. <laughs> and I'm a real Londoner and I never go further than the M25 and I get twitchy when I have to leave London. But this has been really good training because a small arts organisation called Furling Woods Contemporary um, offered me a residency where I would go and collect stories from people in the woods about how they felt about woods, trees, nature and so on. And I had to go and stay there, it was terrible. And um, I've made a book called The Listening Forest, the really great big book that's a facsimile of the drawings that I drew, which were A3, is actually a 30 meter long book. And I've just seen it today for the first time. I'm sorry I haven't brought one to show you because it was just, it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, and some of the stories that people told me I just wrote down verbatim because I do love collecting everybody's different voices, as you can tell even from the previous poems. For example, this little sod here. We had a cousin the same age as my brother who used to come and stay. They didn't really get on, although my mum would always try and make them play together. One time my brother was sat at the table reading his comic, and mum looked a bit alarmed. Where's Martin? Oh, I took him to the woods and we played cowboys and Indians. I tied him to a tree. I'll go and get him later. <laughs> so there's just like, some of the stories are just really ordinary and dreary. And actually the really ordinary ones go in shrub section, shrub layer. Because I've divided the book metaphorically into these layers, like shrub layer. And that's where people just are in their community and they just decide to tolerate their different leaves. And um, in, obviously in the kind of undergrowth layer, there's a lot of secrets and people who feel a bit prickly and, you know, you can get caught on your own brambles and other people's. And then path is obvious. Um, and I, what I've done is I've done a cut out, I've done a cut out picture to kind of hold the drawings together, the stories and the book together. So for Canopy, which is about having sort of lofty thoughts and being a little bit superior, like that boy you just heard of, that's in the Canopy layer where you're kind of a bit above things. And the clearing has this cut out of the deer. So I'll read you some of the poems that I also, and my voice is also in here. And I wrote some poems in the heart and the wood, sadly in my own voice. Um, I'll read you one called Disturbing Mother. If you're an adult and sing insipid songs to nature, she'll eat you. Like Ivan, you must demand a hot bath, a hot dinner. Then she'll wink and you'll get along just fine. She's an old, old hag, dripping with green jewels. And she doesn't care about you. She doesn't care about her gleaming yellow toadstools, her adorable fawns, or her resilient clumps of insect eggs. She doesn't give a fig about this poem I'm writing. She is writing the actual poem, full of scorn, wonder, acres of scratched black sky and trees. Her scroll of references goes back a hundred thousand years. Her poem is breathing us alive, breathing us our sheepish hesitations, our tender little egos, our axe-wielding certainties, but never thank her, she despises manners. Who has time for those when locked in a permanent half Nelson by God? 
This is the poem when I was coming home back to London, um, which was a bit, you know, of a thing. Back to Earth. I load the dented greenie with head-sized bumping apples, swerve them through golders, breaking only for professors. Gary, our teenager with ASD, bounces out in khaki gabardine, bangs the gate, grabs my flimsy green valise. Our fence induces gasps, newly painted tea dance green. Gary cranks open the boot, gross metallic motor gesture, out clunks the battering of apples. A grasshopper escaped here from her rustic garrison, springs off a meek fruit. Greetings, Greenie. I tip the hair-legged pet from my cupped hands to Gary's owner. Goggle of grasshopper eyes, tickle of grasshopper legs, green smell of gloss paint, Carl toxed apples. Gary grins. Briefly, we're in league. It's Friday. We're free. We're greenies. Our shouts graffiti the street. Now, have I got time for a couple more poems? Yes. Super job. Okay. Um, this little book, Hurricane Butter, I produced as a kind of black and yellow tombstone for my little mum, who died. She wasn't little at all, she was huge. <laughs> and um, I'm just putting her in, her po in my pocket by making a pocket-sized book about her. And this is a, she was a textile designer. Textiles have come up earlier, I think. Um, and I made this poem where all the E's, it was just an Ulipian kind of, what are they called? Univocalism. So just one vowel E. Please, if there are any moments where you notice I've cheated, don't say anything. Um, anyway, it's called Elegy. Resent the mess? Yes. She left these severe debts. Enter the den she recently deserted. See her perky red dresses, the firm green bevel-edged chest, her very decent bed. Feel her greed, her tenderness, queenly jewels, dented gems, blessed shreds. Let trees shelter her, let her rest. She spent her relentless temper. She's been demented here. Then sweet, serene. See the kettle? Let's feed these lesser gentlemen. Egg and cress. Express regret. Tell them she'll never ever reply. Her shredded letters feed ferrets. They get preener's nests. Freckle the nettles. Let the queen, the empress herself, be free. She's everywhere. She's where beetles creep where the breeze swells the weeds, where we sleep. Now, I'm going to give you the choice. Forest, German, mother, ghost hotel. Please, if you have a... Ghost hotel. Ghost hotel. You said it. Okay. The Ghost Hotel is a tiny little book. You couldn't really grace it with the word book. It's more, if we're honest, a leaflet. Anyway, um, it's made of one sheet of paper which I've cunningly folded in the shape of a book. A, a ruse that some of you may be familiar with. And in it, I have a little drink with three dead female poets that I quite like. And it says on the back, a Russian, an American, and an English woman walk into a bar. I'm there too, we spill our beans and let our cats out all over the hushed and hoovered carpet of what turns out to be the lobby of a strange hotel. The carpet is magic, it reassembles the letters and our names into poems, then flies back with drinks. Do you remember that afternoon? Raise a toast in honour of it to Anna Akhmatova, Elizabeth Bishop and Rosemary Tonks. And so, in each vessel, Obviously, Anna Akhmatova had a samovar, and if you Google her, you can see her actual samovar online. And I've done my best to copy it here, and in it I've brewed up her letters of her name and my letters of my name, which has given us a lot of A's, but not that many other things. <laughs> and in the cocktail shaker that I felt would suit Elizabeth Bishop, we have a better variety of letters. 
and in the coffee pot that me and Rosemary Tonks have drunk from, we have also quite a good assortment. So it's their letters and my letters, so it's about half the alphabet, and the poems are written in that half of the alphabet. Which poet do you now vote for? Have you, you get the choice. Rosemary Tonks, Elizabeth Bishop, or Anna Akhmatova? Oh, I think you should have a shout round. Who wants Elizabeth Bishop? Elizabeth Bishop. Elizabeth Bishop. Not too many. Anna <laughs> <laughs> Akhmatova? Tonks? Yes, Anna. Tonks. Rosemary Tonks? Uh, Tonks. 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 Well, this is pretty, pretty it's easy. Tight, right? it's it's tight, let's right? go for Rosemary Tonks. I think because he was very bold about requesting ghosts, <coughs> we have to go for this Tonks wish. OK, Tonks. Say, a pity my heart is in a rare pot on a one ray on street. Those trips I took, she took, to the exit shore. Yes, share stories, honey rank orators, miss sm smoky sinks. See the monsters, there are so many. Mothers, men, a series, some to astonish, some to simper at, a mishmash, stripy shirt tossers, satyrs, reasoners. Try a remorse party, a posh rant to roar at one another. These hints make me trip near the mistakes hers. Oh no, the stink is here, it's sex. Then it's a misty pram on the Romney marshes. A prose map in neat ink, not messy tanks of spat in misery. Time to sit in a morose room in Soho, steer moans into poems, take tea on a pink tray, retox. Mm -hmm. <laughs>